All right, I saw one of these times we're going to get talking and I'm just going to forget about starting class and then I'll look down and it's 11.30 and it's like, okay, I guess we're going to the lab then. Uh, but I'm somewhat alert today, so um, we, that won't be today. So we last time we started looking at database stuff and really this is going to be like a huge part of the rest of the semester. I mean, <coughs> what we have, how many weeks left? This is week seven, right? So we have... Yeah, we're about halfway there. Probably more than three quarters of the remaining lectures will be devoted to database stuff. And we'll, we'll be approaching it, we'll, we'll, we'll talk um, some about just the database stuff, whether it be theory or SQL or, or stuff like that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll spend so much time talking about um, implementing that in the .NET uh, framework. So we'll, we'll go back and forth between, between that as opposed to covering all the, all the database stuff uh, and then covering all the ASP.NET uh, implementation of it. What I'd like to do is start off with where we left off last time and just review it. I'm doing it just for my own purposes as much as for anyone else's. Um, my brother was in town this weekend and we went to the football game on Sunday, we saw the first lead of the year for the Browns. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I swear, by the time it was done, it was like, I think it was just me and my two brothers in the stadium. I think it was it. And these ushers, like, just, like, looking at us, like, what are you guys going to leave? I want to go home. Like, how was everybody when they, when they decided to go for it on fourth down? And, and then failed. Did the place just well, after that? Yeah, and, and it was it was largely, I swear to God, I think, I don't know if it was the same person because the person was behind me, but I swear there was a person saying, go for it, go for it, go for it. They failed. It's like, why don't they just go for the field goal? I swear it was the same person behind me, like, <laughs> like in two seconds time. Now, it might have been like someone next to him or something, but uh, yeah. And Jay. So we talked a lot of last time about, and, and before we actually show the example on the screen, we talked a lot about last time about just sort of basic defining databases. And I think it's important to do that, you know. I don't think it's a case of like, you learn this stuff and that's it. I think every time you come up with a topic or every time you look at a topic or address a topic, I think you kind of understand it on a deeper level, or at least there's a possibility to understand it uh, on, on a deeper level. And so what, uh, what I did is we, we went back and we defined some database terms. We defined a database, and uh, we defined that as being um, a collection of related data. And we talked about the process of transforming data into information, with data being um, just the raw facts, sort of the raw materials, and information being something that we can take and actually use. Um, data by itself isn't necessarily usable, right? We have to somehow manipulate it. We have to somehow process it. In the old days, they called it data processing. Um, I think they, they switched the term to information technology to put sort of the focus on the goal instead of like the ingredients. So what we talked about, and really the, the, the conclusion we came from is that to take your data and to transform it in, in, into information, There's really two key elements that will allow this to go better, all right? And one of them is the flexibility. In other words, when you transform data into information, if you can do this a variety of different ways, and we talked about some of the ways that you can do this. You can do it by combining data together, by summarizing data together by getting exception information. In other words, don't show me everything in the database, show me things that fit some certain criteria, uh, some exceptional criteria. Um, by combining things, by summarizing, by combining things maybe in an unexpected way. All right, That's the whole process of what's called data mining, where they take databases and they look for stuff that they wouldn't expect to find. You know, they run statistical programs and they do all kinds of stuff, but it's, it's, really, really good feel. 
Um, today they talk a lot about big data, where you have so much, so much data out there that there's bound to be some information in there. We just have to figure out how to get to it. So the key, one of the keys in doing that is flexibility. And databases allow that because of the fact that we have this, these relationships between data. Each piece of data isn't like a silo. We gave the analogy, which was an okay analogy, but comparing databases to um, like sets of spreadsheets, where it's very difficult to relate one thing to another. With databases, that's easy because the relationships are built right in to there. The other thing that we talked about is, that's key, is the accuracy. <coughs> And we talked about the oldest acronym in computer science, garbage in, garbage out. If you start with bad ingredients, you can't end up with a good cake. All right? So the more accurate the data is, the better the information it will yield. And databases play a role in this too. Of course there's going to be human error. You know, you, could, you, know, you might want to type in 22 and you type in 32 or something like that. Of course there's a possibility. And there's nothing we can do to prevent that. But we can build constraints in the database. And we talked about some of those constraints, like only allowing data, uh, numeric data, in a particular field. Only allowing uh, a certain field is required. Uh, we talked about um, uh, primary key constraints, whereas um, every row has to have a unique key. We talked about a little bit about foreign key constraints, where something in table A has to match up with something in table B. So you can't have, if you design your database correctly, you can't have an order that relates to a non-existent customer. Right. You just can't do that. It's not, you know, you can't if you define the constraints correctly. And all these things really add up to more accurate data more flexible ways to present it, and therefore we can do a better job transforming the data into information. So then we talked about, just to review, we talked about tables and columns and keys, primary keys and foreign keys and so on. Then we went to see how this works in Access. And we did just a quick query of Everyone wanted to do a pizza example, so you twisted my arm to do a pizza example. And here's our database. We defined just one table so far. Not much to spend um, examining that. The one thing that we did mention <coughs> is that the app data folder, app underscore data, is where the database <coughs> belongs. In the case of using a file-based database, like um, Access is. We just have one table. We have a table of toppings. All right. We look at it in design view. The primary key is an auto number key. An auto number key is simply just a number that goes in sequence, starting with one and, and so far. This is known sometimes as a, uh, a surrogate key um, because that number doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean anything if... Um, if uh, like one is pepperoni, or if one was sausage, or if one was mushroom, the, the number being assigned can be arbitrary. True. All right. So that's what's called a surrogate key. The other kind of key that you could have is a natural key. 
And a natural key would be something like if we used the airport code, let's say, you know, how each airport in the country has like a three-letter airport code. I think Cleveland is CLE, you know, um, it's a shame I don't know a lot of uh, airports, but, um, you know, Chicago's O'Hare versus Chicago Midway has a different airport code and, and all that. That's a code that's like used out in the real world, all right? That's what's known as a natural key. Uh, and again, that defines uh, a natural uh, a key, regardless if it's a surrogate or a natural key, is required. All right, you have to have a value for it. We put other things: uh, a topping name, a description, which is more like a marketing thing. We made the topping name required, the description not required, and the calories we made also not required. This is a constraint, believe it or not, that, that you define the data type because that keeps uh, the data to a certain values. We can go between design view where we see the structure of the database and A view like this, which is sort of a spreadsheet view, where we see um, the actual toppings along with their name and uh, other fields. One thing that you might catch, you might have thought about, this is sort of a, a um, sort of a, a second level sort of database thing, is, is there anything in this table other than topping ID that could be the primary key? Topping name. Could the topping name be a primary key? Does every topping have a topping name? Well, it better, right? You know, I want that mystery topping on my pizza. No, it's not going to work. It has to have a topping name. And it has to be unique, right? If there were two toppings called pepperoni, that would be really confusing. So if there are two different kinds of pepperoni, you would need to qualify the name like, um, you know, regular pepperoni, old style pepperoni, or something like that. So the topping name could be a primary key to this table. But I chose an auto number. Why did I choose an auto number? So it generates it automatically? It does generate it automatically, and I don't have to worry about it. That's true. Other, other thoughts? Yes? Yeah, it's more efficient to store a number as opposed to a letter, especially when you consider that the primary key in one table is going to be foreign keys in another table. All right? So, um, because of that, I, I store a number. Now, right now, we have a problem now, right? What's the problem that we have right now in this table? Someone is so frustrated that they can't see the problem in this table, so they're pounding on the board from behind. What's the problem with this table? Well, the problem with this table is I could do this. Um, We'll say this is tofu pepperoni, but we call it pepperoni. Yeah. Boy, that makes some people mad, wouldn't it? Yeah. Pepperoni. And it allowed me to put it in. All right. This is one little catch when you use a surrogate key like this. What is the way to correct this? Make them both primary keys. Make them both primary oh. keys. Mm, good thought. But no. One rule of primary keys is that primary keys are to be minimal. All right? What does that mean to say it's minimal? In other words, if the topping ID by itself is enough to identify it uniquely, then if you combine topping ID with something else, then the primary key isn't minimal. 
So in other words, this column is enough by itself to be the primary key. So if we combine that with this column and have a two-part primary key, that, that is, that's not good database design. We can have two parts of the key. We can have two parts to the key. For example, we could have a city name and a state name, all right, because there's like a Cleveland, Mississippi, and there's a Cleveland, Ohio. But in that case, neither of them by themselves is enough to be a primary key. So that's the only time you're allowed to have a multiple part key. You could do some, yeah, you could do something like that in some databases. Uh, there are things called stored procedures where after you do an insert or before you do an insert, you could go and do some logic, all right? Um, so that would be a possibility. Access doesn't allow that, all right? And there's actually an easier solution. Um, you wouldn't want to put the statement in your program, all right? Because that would then require every program that updated this table to have that logic in it, all right? So there'd be database logic in all of your application code. And the problem with that is that what if someone gets it wrong? Then all of a sudden, boom. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll stop for a second to reminisce fondly about the past, all right? I worked in an environment that was pre-database where we didn't use databases, we used files. We used index files. They were called like ISAM files. Um, index Sequential Access Method. I think that's what ISAM stood for. But these are COBOL programs. And in COBOL programs, you do not have the constraints built into databases. So you had to put the constraints in your programs. All right? Um, so you declare a file there's nothing in there that says, you know, there are very minimal constraints, let's put it that way. Um, well, we had, and there definitely wasn't referential integrity constraints. So the problem we had is we set it up so that an order had to have a valid customer number. And we had that code everywhere in our application. Yet guess what? Two or three years after it was in use, there were orders with invalid customer numbers. Why? Because we missed something. We missed what happens when you delete a customer or when you change a customer's customer number or this or that. Who knows? But the problem is when you implement the constraints in code within the application, it has to be perfect every time or you're going to get bad data. There's actually an easy way to do this in the database, and that is to declare this as, a, as an index and to declare it specifically as a unique index. Now, if I go and try to do that now and make the topping name a unique index, if I go to save it, it's going to give me an error. Do I want to save it? Yep. Tells me I can't do that. Why? Because there's already bad data in there. There's already duplicates. So it won't let me save this constraint as being no duplicates. So what I would have to do to correct this is I would have to go in I'm going to have to go and undo that and say no index. I'd have to go and delete this guy Then I could go in and make this a unique index. <coughs> and now, if I tried to save pepperoni twice, it won't allow me to do it. All right? So when you have surrogate keys, if there are any candidate keys, and what's a candidate key? A candidate key is another field or fields that you could make the primary key. You should make an, a unique index for them. Indexes are valuable in databases because they allow you to look things up quicker. 
So even if it is not a unique key, you might want to uh, index it. We'll be an example in, let's say, a student database of something that might be a non-unique index, something that you would index but would not be unique. Well, how would you answer that question? You'd answer that question by saying, what does it mean to index it? All right? And what does a non-unique index give me? It gives me a second way to look someone up. So, for example, I call Giant Eagle Pharmacy to see if my prescription's ready. What are they going to ask me for? What's your prescription number? I don't know my prescription number. What are they going to ask me for next? Well, what's your name? All right? So a name would be an alternative way to look up the prescription number. If you went over to the um, uh, registration or whatever and you said you had a problem with your schedule and they'd say, well, what's your student number? I don't know my student number. Okay, what's your name? So they'd pull you up by your name. So anytime you have a field that um, you might want to look up by, especially when you have a large volume of data, you would make an index for it for that reason. So we make indexes for two reasons. One is to implement the unique constraint so that we don't have duplicates in a field that is not the primary key. The second is to provide quick lookups. And the quick lookups are really only needed in really big files, right? Um, the way databases work is if you have a key, it will use that index to look for it. Think of a key as being like the, the number uh, of a library book in a library. So if you know the number of your book, if the number of your book is like 701.3, you can write, walk right to the stacks and find 701.3 and look and find your book. If there were no indexes like that on the book, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to start looking at the first book in the library, see if that's the book that you wanted. If it wasn't, look at the next one, look at the next one, look at the next one. That wouldn't be a very good way to do it. So <coughs> indexes allow you to do those quick lookups. Questions about that? All right. So that was the only table that we had. I'm going to get out of this. Oh. And it's going berserk. I have to change that before it will let me save it. Now it can save it because that is unique now. All right. Back to our application. We talked about this a little bit with the sitemap uh, XML file and the sitemap uh, path, the breadcrumbs. But what we have in a lot of things in ASP.NET, a lot of pages in ASP.NET, is we have controls that are bound together. All right? Specifically, we have, we have um, our data source, which says where the data comes from. Secondly, we have a visual component that says how it's going to be displayed on the page. So we did that with sitemap path, right? We had a sitemap um, XML file, and then we bound that to our menu view, and, we, and it, that was automatically bound to the sitemap path view. Well, in this case, we have, again, our two components. Our SQL data source, which says where in the database it is, and then finally we have a what's called a grid view. Of course. We're going to look at um, we're going to look at a number of these different visual uh, um, controls that we can bind it to. The first one we looked at is a grid view, and we'll go and we'll create once we'll create another one of these later on today. Uh, you know, just to, to show the process from scratch. The SQL data source says where the data comes from. So if we go here and say configure SQL data or configure data source, first thing we have is a connection string. 
The connection strings defines what database we're connected to. All right. An application could potentially have multiple databases. All right. Usually when we think of, a, of an application, we think of it, they're, it being connected to a single database. But it's not unheard, unheard of to have two database connections. All right. Especially when you're dealing with like old legacy systems that haven't been converted yet and maybe some of the data is in one place, some of the data is somewhere else. It's possible to have two deba database connections. So we specify some parameters about the database connection and we save it and we give it a connection name. Where does that connection information get saved? What was that? In the web config? You're right. Whoever said that is absolutely right. Yes. It's saved in the web config file. Of course. And we look at it, we will see there's a section for config uh, connection strings. There's the name of the connection string. There's the provider, that's what software is being used to access it. That's what it will be for access. The connection string looks its way for access. And the data source points to the file where the database is. Access, again, is a file-based database system. Your database is just like in a file. Notice that the prefix to this, to the file name, because of the, the data source file name is pizza.accdb, the prefix to this is this thing here with the two pipes, the vertical lines, sometimes called pipes, um, with the word data directory in between. What that means is your application's app data folder. You can configure it to be other things, but typically it's going to be your application's app data folder. That is what you want to see here. You do not want to see something that looks like this. I'm going to go and, and paste this in Word. Or actually Notepad++. You would not see something, you would not want to see something that looked like this. C colon back, back um, slash um, users slash mzellers slash ziss243 slash pizza slash acc. Why do I not want to see something that looks like that, that looks like a complete file name? Can you put on the destination computer you would see that? Exactly, because that would work only on the computer it was originally defined on. Unless, coincidentally, I happen to have exactly those same folders, which I'm not going to have, right? So you don't want to use absolute folder paths. You want to use that relative path of saying, in my application's data directory. So before you turn in your application, look at that. All right? Look at the web config file and look at the connection string and look to see if the data source looks like this, where it has a drive and a list of folders and, and so on. It should not look like that. If it looks like that, I'm not able to easily grade it. It should look like this. Data source, vertical pipe, data directory, vertical pipe, slash, pizza, ACC, DB. All right, let's go back to this. 
once you've saved the connection string, you should never have to create another data, uh, database connection string unless you're using another database, right? Um, what's sort of the fundamental guiding principle in this class is that everything that we do is only in one place. So we would not want the same connection string in our web config file in two places. All right. Why? Well, if we have to change one, then we have to change the other one as well. Otherwise, it's not something's going to not work. All right. So the database connection string ties to something in the web config. The web config says what the database is that we're opening. And if you think about it, this is really nifty because you can then work on, for example, a test database while you're testing your application. And then for your application to go live, all you should have to do would be to put in the proper information for your real database, your production database. Interestingly enough, then the other database could be on an entirely different platform. You could be testing on an access database, and when you go live in production, have it point to a SQL Server database, or have it point to an Oracle database, or so on. Um, years ago, I did that. We had Oracle at, at our office, and we, would, we were writing an application that worked up against Oracle, but I didn't have Oracle installed on my laptop, and when I wanted to take it home to work on it, I would bring it home, change the connection string to point to my local access database, and when I got into work and I wanted to work off of the production database or the work test database, I'd simply change the connection string. Theoretically, find some fake wood knock on it, theoretically that's all you should have to change is a connection string and you should be able to connect to another database. All right, next. Next we specify the query that we want. And I think we used the query designer last time. I went and I just picked by specifying columns from a table or view. Um, or you can specify the custom SQL statement, which we'll look at. Or stored procedure. We don't have stored procedures in access, so we can ignore that. <coughs> this shows us the SQL statement. And when I finish this, we will um, look at the SQL statement in more detail. And then we'll do a little bit more database theory and then maybe we'll implement that today. All right. Select topping ID, topping name, description, calories from toppings, order by topping name. That is the SQL statement. If you're not a SQL expert, you can go to the Query Builder and you get a little like graphical interface to make your query sort of like the graphical interfaces in Access. Uh, yeah. I click Next. I can test my query. This is a good idea to do, right? The problem with developing applications the way we do these days in a very component-based system is if something isn't working, you have to do a little troubleshooting to determine which component is broken. Is it this component or that component? All right? Or are both components fine and the components just aren't talking to each other correctly? All right? So what you can do is you can test this part of it by running test query. So I click test query, and that looks like it's correct. So if something doesn't work in the next step, I know that it's probably not the fault of the SQL statement. Click Finish. All right. That is the SQL data source. The other part of this is I have a grid view. A grid view is sort of the basic, most straightforward way to display several rows from the database. It displays them as a table. What's a table? A table is a structure with rows and columns. So each row in the table corresponds to a row in the query. Each column represents a field. All right? I went 
and simply drag that over from grid view here onto the page. And then the last thing I did is I bound them together. I chose a data source. And that data source is going to be the only data source I have, SQL data source 1. All right. If I don't do that, then I'm going to get sort of an empty <coughs> query when I run this. So now when I run this, I get the results of the database. Results of the database query on this page. And again, this is dynamic. Last week when we ran this, there was no tofu pepperoni on there because I just added that today. Today when I go and add this, I go and run this, I see the thing added. And if I went right now and added something and hit refresh, it would be there again. Questions about this? All right. Let's spend a minute looking at a SQL statement. We had a SQL select statement, and we'll look at it. We'll look at it in more detail. Because you can use a query builder, but it's always good to know the SQL statement on your own. So, uh, in other words, don't use a query builder as a crutch. Use a query builder as a tool that will help you. Okay, possibly. 
like maybe you don't want to see the toppings, you just want to see like all the pizza at the end. Okay, that's possible. How did you? Well, what I'm thinking of is the topping ID. All right, the topping ID is just a sequential number. There's no rhyme or reason to the topping ID, right? Topping one is pepperoni because that's the first one I put in. Yeah. What's topping two? I don't even remember. All right. <laughs> Whatever it is. Mushrooms, maybe. Basil. Pineapple. Pineapple. Right. But it's, it, it's, it's, it's totally arbitrary. It's just the order that I put it in. That is meaningless to a user. If anything, that might confuse a user. What does that number one mean? Is that the top right topping uh, here? Ooh, I better try that one. No, it's just the order I put it in. However, the topping is an important column, right? It's the primary key. So I might want the primary key selected. In fact, you probably will, like all the time, want the primary key selected from a table. Just if for nothing else, for stuff that happens behind the scenes. So I probably will always select the primary key, but I might not want to display it. Now, how do you do that? That gets back to remembering the difference between the data source and the visual control that are bound together. Those things are separate. My data source is the data that I'm pulling out of the database. The visual control, in this case, the grid view, is how I'm displaying it. So I could configure the grid view not to display the ID. Oh, I'll just pop up this for a second just to show you how to do it. Again, were a user to see this, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Three, four, one, two, six. It's not alphabetical order. Um, what does that mean? Well, we know behind the scenes that that's the key, but the user isn't really going to understand that. Now, we might want to retrieve this data because we might want to, we might have an administrative application that actually allows us to add new toppings or change a topping or whatever. So the way that I would do that is, one edit the data source, because I want it in the data source, but I'm going to change the grid view, and I'm going to edit the columns, and I'm going to get rid of the toppings ID. So you can go and you can customize a grid view. <coughs> so topping name, I could change the text, just the name. Right? Why didn't I call it name in the first place? Does anyone remember? Why did I call it topping name instead of name? Name is a reserved word in the database. So it gave me a warning when I created this <coughs> column. And it's probably not a good idea to call it name. So I called it topping name. But I might want to display name to the user. Again, the difference between what we're retrieving and how we're displaying it to the user. So now when we go and do this query, this is what we see. And the user isn't mystified with those fields that we don't, that they don't really know what they mean. So again, remember the notion of binding, that stuff comes from some place, the data comes from a certain place, and it's displayed in another control. Now, there are a bunch of optional clauses with SQL. All right? And they go in a specific order. All right? And we'll consider two of them right now. And then other ones we'll probably consider as the course goes on. One of them is the WHERE clause. And the WHERE clause allows us to define criteria. All right? Very rarely do we want to see everything from a database table. I guess something like the toppings table is a small table, so we might want to see that. But if you could imagine going to a library, you know, 
Would you want to see a listing of all the books in the library? No, it doesn't make any sense. You'd give some criteria. I want to see books by Stephen King. I want to see books about geology. I want to see whatever. All right? The where clause is what, is what limits what rows get displayed. So here we define the columns that are being displayed. Here we specify the criteria of what rows we display. So we could put a where clause on here that would say something like where calories equal, or let's say, less than 10. So we could have a page that showed all our toppings, and we could have another page that showed these are our low-calorie toppings, if you wanted to. So with the where clause, we specify criteria that limits the output. What do we have to do to the, what do you think we have to do to the grid view to make this work? Absolutely nothing. Because a grid view is simply the display of the data. That's what's nice about this notion of having a data source and the visual <coughs> aspect of it, the UI aspect of it. All right? If we change something about how the data is selected, we shouldn't have to touch, with, again, few exceptions, we shouldn't have to touch the visual thing, the data, the, the grid view. Likewise, if we change the order of the columns in the grid view and, and change the color of the heading and blah, 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 we shouldn't have to touch the data source. We're still pulling the same data, we're just tweaking how it's displayed a little bit. All right, next clause, next optional clause, is the order by clause. The order by clause says what order it's going to be displayed in. Now, nice thing is, is this is, let me rephrase that. This will tell me the order that the data in the data source is, is, is sequenced in. We can actually write stuff that will sort it in the grid view regardless of how it was sorted in the, um, in the initial uh, SQL retrieve. Order by, we can put a column or list of columns. <clears throat> so I think I said order by topping name. By default, that will be ascending order. Ascending order means from lowest to highest. And when we're talking about letters, the lowest letter is A, the highest letter is Z. All right? So this would go, this is traditional alphabetical order from A through Z. If you don't specify ascending or descending, it assumes ascending. You can also do this, ASC, to indicate ascending. If you want it the other way around, Maybe we want to show calories from the most calories to the least. We would say DESC, descending. And descending simply is the opposite, from highest to the lowest. So let's look at this. Select. That's always going to be the word select. Followed by a list of the columns that we want to pull from the database. From specifies what table those columns in. Where gives us criteria that says to what rows we're going to see. And finally, order by says the order that those rows are going to appear. We can also combine things like sort calories, topping name, I'll make them both ascending. 
So this would show the lowest calories on top. Within a given calorie amount, it would show them in alphabetical order. So you can like have a subsort within a sort. One thing that, that you should sort of get a sense for is if I want to change something about the thing on the page, do I change the data source or do I change the grid view? And sometimes the answer is either. All right. For example, sorting. The initial sort will come from the data source, but I can also <coughs> change the grid view to allow sorting as well. All right, let's go and put some of these. Let's do some of these things and view the effect. And let's do some playing around with the grid view appearance. Because right now, I've just largely taken the default for the grid view. All right? So if I want more control over the, what the grid view looks like, um, I probably should go in and, and customize the appearance of it. So let's go and do that. Let's see what we can do, first of all. I'm going to go and put a where clause on this guy. Configure data source. Next. Specify custom SQL statement. Select topping ID, topping name, description, calories from toppings. Order by topping name, I'm going to put in there order by calories. Comma copying, uh, topping name. And I'm going to put a where clause in here. Usually, I will type in the SQL statement like one clause per line just to make it more readable. Where calories equals or less than 10, I think I said. A couple of things just style-wise. Notice that I have calories with a lowercase c and a calories with an uppercase c. Um, it probably should be consistent, but column names are not case sensitive. So I could put it either way, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. The SQL statement will work. The other thing that you might notice is that, and the, this is a code that the computer generated, it puts square brackets around the column <coughs> names. Uh, the square brackets are useful if you have a space in the field name. So if I said topping space name, I would, put, I would have to put that column name in square brackets because that will tell it that that space is part of the column name, the square brackets. If I don't have any spaces in the middle, uh, then I don't really need uh, the square brackets. Also, if I don't have any, if I, if I didn't take the uh, access as advice and I, I used a reserve word, I could put the reserve word in brackets and then it would know it's a column name. But notice I have column, uh, the column name calories without any brackets around it and it's going to work just fine. All right. Um, so this, this example is sort of mixed and matched. Uh, again, it would be better to do it in a consistent way, but this is a good talking point to say that it really doesn't matter if you use the, 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 the square braces unless there's a space in there, then you have to use it. And likewise, typically databases are not case sensitive. So I click a next, do a test query, and I see this is what I get. Finish. I now retrieve this, and we'll notice that our grid changes. 
The grid changed without having to do anything to the grid view, right? Because we didn't change what was being displayed. We simply changed the data source. So we only have to change one. So it's good to sort of get in your mind if you're making a change. Think about it and decide, is this something that I'm going to need to change the grid view for or is this something I'm going to need to change the data source for? All right, fun with the grid view. There is an auto far format that you can click on and you can give it a certain view. I'm going to pick sand and sky. I click OK. And now my grid view looks like that. see what it actually did. It actually stuck a bunch of stuff in my grid view. <laughs> It specified a back color, a border color, a border width, a cell padding, four color, grid lines. It's stuck in an alternating row style, a footer style, a header style, a pager style, a selected row styler, and so on and so forth. I don't think I like that. Why do you think I don't like that? Because it makes it too easy for you. No, just kidding. I don't like it because this is a non-CSS solution. Okay, what does that mean? So what if it's a non-CSS solution? It means that this styling code is into, into the page. So I would have to get it, if I wanted consistency across my site, I would have to know to make every one of my grid views have this style to it. Is that a big deal? I don't know. I guess it's not too bad because I don't have to style these things individually. But someone could come back later and change it on one page or whatever. I generally prefer a CSS-based solution to this. All right? I'm not going to say don't do it, but just be aware of the implications of that. When you pick that auto formatting, it injects the style code right as part of the grid view, which you should know is probably, uh, in, in, a, in, in you know, taking a bigger view of it, probably not a good idea. What I can do instead is, let's see if I can undo this. Remove formatting, good. I can write my own CSS code. How do I write my own CSS code? Well, I want to make sure I understand what the HTML generated was. So I'm going to look and see what the HTML generated is. I think this is getting longer every time I run this. All right, I'm going to view source. Maybe. It's 
thinking about it. And I can scroll down and I can look and I can see that this is a table. Already it has cell spacing and all that. Ooh. Its ID is grid view. And it has a bunch of TRs and THs. And it has already some style on that. Which I'm going to see if I can go and get rid of. So let me go and look at this. create a CSS file. I don't want a new website. File, new, file. style sheet. And I could do things like, I could either approach it by looking at the ID, or I could uh, approach it by uh, giving the HTML tags, depending on which uh, strategy I want to take. So, for example, I could say table, I'm going to do this actually. I'm going to change uh, it to a class of data table with 60% background. Pound sign I have to look up how to do alternating uh, rows.
idea here is I can point to different things and style them using CSS. I'm going to go here and I'm going to say this grid view has a class name of CSS classes data table. Then I need to go and put that CSS on this page, and we should be good to go. better solution, in my mind, than using the, um, what, what is it, what is it called, auto format options, because it's a CSS based solution. All I need to know is to make everyone have a data table, all right, uh, as its class, and I'm good to go, all right? Here's what I want you to think about for next time. Here's what I want you to think about for Thursday. Let's say my pizza place offers a certain number of specialty pizzas. specialty pizzas. Each specialty pizza could consist of one or more toppings. All right? So, I might have a Hawaiian pizza that contains ham and pineapple. I might have the veggie pizza that contains mushrooms, olives, banana peppers, and so on. Meat lovers, which has pepperoni and sausage. So, my pizza place has these pizzas has any number of specialty pizzas. Each pizza, each specialty pizza has a name, that is the meat lovers, and when you order that pizza, you automatically get these three toppings. All right? Or four toppings, or one topping, or however many toppings. All right? What I'd like you to do is think about, and all of you have had some experience with databases, correct? Yes. Okay. What I'd like you to do is think about the database design for this. We already have the one table, the toppings table. What additional tables do we need to make this happen? <coughs> All right? So think about that, because that's where we'll begin the discussion on Thursday. So we'll talk about that for a while. I'd like to see what you came up with. And then we will actually go and implement this in Access and actually do some queries on our page based on these things. All right. 
So that's where we'll pick up on Thursday. Any questions? I'm going to run the lab to open it up, and then I'll be back here to get my files, and then I'll be back in lab. So right. we'll see you in lab.